All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. Are you ready? Yep. Good, day, good evening, everybody. I'm Andy Grant. I would love to have a conversation with you about my photography. I call it gestural photography, and I'll explain uh, in depth uh, why I refer to it as gestural photography. Um, but let me just give you some background on myself and my connection with art. Uh, My grandmother was a watercolor artist, my father is a watercolor artist. I tried watercolor, I took a class, and I just kind of froze. I think the idea of a legacy and the sense of uh, comparing what I was producing to what these others had produced was just uh, kind of stifling for me. I have always done Photography. Uh, for me, when I was growing up, the um, the art department was my refuge. I could go and do art, including ceramics, drawing, painting, and photography. I learned to do darkroom processing in high school. I was a photographer for our college newspaper, the Exponent, and I uh, I still remember the time when Maya Angelou came as a guest to our college, and I, uh, I flashed my camera one too many times about five feet away from her, and she said, young man, if you do that one more time, I'm gonna take that camera and throw it to the ground. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't do photography for a long time after college, and 10 years ago, uh, in 2007, I was going through a big change in my life. I had a lot of open up uh, free time, but also a lot of emotional turmoil and a sense of being adrift. And one of the things I did in that space, oh Peter, come on in, I just got started. So one of the things I did in that, in that space of transition was um, uh, went out and purchased a camera. This is the actual camera. At the time, it felt like a splurge, like I was spending money I didn't have, and I, I had to kind of rationalize to myself this purchase. Um, and I'm the kind of person who likes to know how things work. So I was in a process of kind of investigating and experimenting, playing with the camera, which included uh, the settings on the camera, um, the, the setting here for P and M. The M has to do with the 
uh, time that the shutter remains open when it takes a picture. And I was playing around that, extending the shutter speed on the camera. And um, on one particular winter day, January 7, 2007, I went up to Petticoat Hill outside of, I'll pass that around for you, um, Petticoat Hill uh, in the neighborhood where my parents lived, where I was living at the time, and went for a hike and I had this camera with me. And like I said, I was playing around. The other background to understand is that at that time I was having long conversations with, with my father about patterns of growth in nature. And I had in my, my head the idea that the meristem, the growth tip of a tree, if you extrapolate the growth pattern over the life of the tree and imagine the growth tips as like um, sparklers, the tree itself in its lifespan goes something like this. Right? So I've got that in mind. So put all that together. A guy who's at loose ends, a beautiful winter morning, this new camera, and thinking about patterns of growth. I took a photograph and accidentally moved the camera. And it, it was set on a low shutter speed. And I noticed when I looked in the, the digital preview that there was a branch of a tree standing out like this. And everything else was kind of blurry. I thought that was really strange. I played around some more and I, instead of moving the camera this way, I tried moving the camera this way. And I was stunned to see the trunks of trees become elongated, but also very sharply defined, and the branches washing away. Three hours later, I've done this kind of dancing and playing with my camera, and ended up with a, a photograph that I have to this day, I call it discovery, referring to the day that I discovered that I could do this with my camera. It was only later that I called the work gestural photography. And the gesture refers to making a gesture with the camera. And it's actually, in my thinking, a reference to painting action painting, or what was also called gestural painting. So Jackson Pollock would be an example of somebody in that school who used motion and action in creating the art that is reflected in what appears on the canvas. For me, when I'm doing this work, it feels that I'm using the camera like a paintbrush. And the elements of the scene, the color, the texture, the shapes, are the components. It's like my palette that I'm working with. So I go into an environment and I'm looking at the quality of light, I'm looking at the color, and I'm especially in love with trees. So you'll see that many of the um, images here are trees. Any questions so far? Peter. Did you say you put it on M or P? Uh, let me show you on the camera that I use today, because when I, I said that I wasn't actually sure, I'd have to, to think back on that. This is the camera that I use today. It's a, it's not a super deluxe camera, it's a basic high quality consumer camera. And what I use today is TV for time value. And on the camera that I showed you, the M is for manual. And it's in the manual setting that you can adjust the time. Okay. Yeah. So is but on this camera, I use TV, which it stands for time value. 
And the value that I set, I can show you here, is uh, that's kind of the sweet spot, one quarter of a second. Now, to give you an idea, a typical shutter speed uh, in an average lighting situation would be about one two fiftieth of a second. So this is quite slow by comparison to a, a, a normal photograph. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a, a bit about these actual uh, scenes here and, and describe to you my experience as a photographer, what the setting is, and what I think is conveyed uh, through this work. Um, here I'm driving to Colerain on a fall day, bright, sunny afternoon, and I see this in my periphery to the left. And I, I park my car on the, the side and get out with my camera. And here, because of the motion of the camera, any spectral highlight in the scene becomes a stroke. So here you see this kind of like straw effect because of that bright lighting, there are many spectral highlights that are just kind of bunched together and those become strokes. You can see the motion of the camera, which isn't exactly a straight line, it's a little bit of a hook. And I'm the guy out there going, like it's kind of bizarre to watch me make these images. Dances with cameras. Dances with cameras, I like that. Um, this comes from one of my favorite, all-time favorite days of photography ever. Uh, Pemaquit Point in Maine is a favorite place of our family to go. This particular day there was a steady breeze coming in, but it wasn't overpowering and the waves were coming in with great intensity, but not so much that it was dangerous. And there was a dome of gray overhead, which was a good lighting condition, nice even low light for me. I had a large lens on the camera, bigger than that one, and a, a, a density filter, the, the darkest density filter that I have. So if I were to shoot here, it would look black with that filter on. But with in, in the middle of the day, with the ocean, it was perfect. And I'm the guy right on the, like right on the brink, watching, 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 and go crawl, crawl. And here, with these, I'm thinking tree. Like here, I'm thinking tree. With this, I'm thinking wave. So my gesture, here's a long sweep, sweep. I'm trying to move with the wave. So uh, not only do I have the composition and focus and depth of field, but I have this other element of clicking the shutter just at the right moment so it feels like a dance. It's a matter of timing. Um, so here, the motion of the camera is kind of a, oh, that was loud. <laughs> uh, like a, a swirling motion, which if I did that with this, it would just be a blurred mess. You wouldn't be able to decipher what it is. But here, because I'm traveling with the waves, you get some uh, representation that comes across. This was especially satisfying to me because these waves were coming in on a long reach. And I think uh, this impression conveys not only that it's a wave, but also that it's in motion. Any questions so far? Yeah. How many exposures or images did you take before you were satisfied with those two? The, the two-way pictures? Uh, this was about a two-hour session. So I literally had hundreds. Um, and to John, it's it's actually, for me, like physically exhausting. Right. And, and to have that level of concentration running 
for that period of time pretty exhausting. But I was in a, a situation where the conditions, I was just like loving it, loving it. And, and that carried me through. But yeah, hundreds of images. And then I'm cropping down to a portion yeah. of, of an image. Yeah, Maddie? Um, you said you had the density filter on for those ones, but how much do you typically alter like the shutter speed or otherwise like for lighting conditions in the moment, or do you do it mostly in editing? Or? Um, I, I have enough controls on this camera so that I can uh, create this kind of a built-in density filter in the camera so I can knock it down and, and pretty much photograph in any mm -hmm. level of light. When I started with the other one, I would only shoot in the edges of the day. So very early morning or toward dusk, because otherwise it was too bright. But I don't have that issue anymore. So you don't alter the shutter speed for lighting at all? You just use that? I do. A uh, quarter of a second is like the sweet spot, but I'm, I'm sometimes going on one side of that or the other, depending on how much light, mm -hmm. low light or, or intense light. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, I call this Bright Ridge, and it's at Woolman Hill, just, just above Woolman Hill. An afternoon again, and the light, I was talking to Maddie about um, a, a family trip that informed how I shoot trees. It was actually a canoe, we paddled canoes up the Pemaquid River in Maine through large uh, stands of, of reeds and we got to look at the reeds from all sides and I noticed that when the light was behind the, the reeds stood up very brightly but they looked flat and likewise when the Sun was coming this way they were in silhouette but very flat but if the Sun was there and I was looking at the reed from the side its roundness and dimensionality came across. So that was a study that has informed how I photograph trees. I'm standing, the sun is coming in this way, I'm standing and you can see the roundedness of the tree. Also that shape right there shows the actual travel of the camera. And I'm keying on this line right here. So it's not just, I'm, I'm actually identifying with an element in the composition and moving that way. Uh, one thing that happens here because of this motion is a kind of weaving effect that I, I like. There's one around the corner that I'll talk more about. Uh, this is Look Park in Northampton, you know, the stands of pine trees in the park, and they have a fungus on them that actually turns the surface a reddish purple color. And here these trees are standing in silhouette. So this demonstrates what I was talking about, about flatness, although you can see the roundedness here, it's not quite as pronounced as it is up there. Philippe, can we move to the... Okay, so a little field trip. Do you mind if I take the lights? To show them? So we'll just go around and talk about these in turn. Um, and I'm going to do a little light trick here to give a little more illumination. Uh, this one is called Knickerbocker Morning. And the setting for this is um, Knickerbocker Lake near our family place in Maine. And again, can you see how the light is coming through here and, and the roundedness of the trees is evident? And again, that technique so here's what I look like when I'm photographing that. I call it a swaggle. <laughs> I usually go from the base upward, and I'm 
See, I'm jiggling the camera like this while going up. So that would be a typical motion. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it goes, wow. And that's what I'm looking for is that wow. So again, I'll just eliminate that a little more. You see that blue streak in the center toward the top? Mm -hmm. That shows the travel of the camera. Yep. Any comments or questions about that? Um, I'm curious. It takes you about three seconds to go up with the camera. Or less, but it's, usually. But, it's a, or, but you're using a quarter of a second. So how does that relate within, because a quarter of a second is done, but you're still moving. Is something happening because you're... I'm yeah, not, I was actually going slow. It's more, and it, it depends, but it's more like, so, yeah. Notice I'm traveling from here to here, but I'm clicking right in the middle. It's a timing thing. So I'm accounting for a quarter of a second to compose the shot. And that's something I can do because I've been doing it 10 years. But I have to click right in the middle of that motion. Okay, so you're yeah. getting the, from below, you're getting at, at, the, at the height and you're getting a little above. Right. In that quarter of, of a second. And when I was starting out, I had lots of pictures of the ground and lots of pictures <laughs> of the sky. Yeah. Um, so this shows trees in silhouette with um, a lake. Hi, Hi, Karen. Hi. Hey, Chris. With a lake behind. And... Uh, this one I like because it looks watery. There are some, sometimes the effect creates the illusion of a screen or a scrim, and this, this moves in that direction. Uh, this is a scene very close to our home. Uh, the Just Roots Farm is right here, and this is in the area near Camp Kiwani. And these are reeds next to a pond. So when I, I see this, for example, I'm literally focusing on that in two ways. I'm focusing the camera, the depth of the camera, on that element, but I'm also concentrating my motion along that line. And the, the truer I am to that line, the more defined and, and pronounced it is. Uh, this is a scene in winter. My partner calls this purple haze. One of the things that this technique does is uh, abstracts. You can tell that it's trees, but it also moves it into a kind of general abstraction. So it's about shapes and color. Uh, these are uh, two small islands. It's an evening light. The sun has set and the light is falling. And what I like about it is that it, it presents the overall atmosphere of that moment in time and space. This and this one here are the same scene in different seasons. Same location, the light coming in silhouette. Here, because of the snow on the ground, the angularity of the shadows is very pronounced. So you have the verticals, the light and dark, and these angles. Uh, this one, I was telling Philippe the story of, about this one. I had climbed Mount Greylock and came down at the end of my climb 
and found this huge expanse of young birch trees. And I didn't have my camera. So I drove all the way home and came back the next morning and just had a wonderful time. Now one thing about the motion, again, uh, just, just think for a moment that these are trees that have little branches that are going out and also those little hash marks on the birch trees. Because of the motion, those are wiped away. And instead you have this kind of bony column effect and the, uh, the atmosphere, cold and warm at the same time. It has dimension, it has size and depth, and brings forward a quality. What I would say about that is that this reflects something of the essence of the scene. If you move it away from a point-by-point -point description of what it is to how it feels, or the life force energy that is in that time and space, that's what I'm going for. That's exquisite. Thank you. Thank you. So. I sort of can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> oh, well said. Wow. Yeah. So I'm up for comments or questions. You guys are printing. Um, I have done a fair amount of the printing myself, and I also use Evolve Fine Art Printing in East Hampton, or the East right. Works building, yeah. Rob Caswell. I don't, I've heard the name, I don't know. Yeah, so he's done the canvases for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the canvases, um, well, when I started out, I was having the canvases printed and then stretching them myself, and that was quite a feat, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm at a place right now, like today, of wondering, is it time for me to lay this down? Is it, has, has it run its course? Is it time to just kind of relax and try another art form, maybe drawing or painting? Now, it's, those of you who are here at the beginning know that that's a complex question for me, but it may be. The other thing is um, some of these pieces, I have a good friend who described this work as vertiginous, meaning inducing vertigo. And some pieces have that effect more than other pieces. And I've been interested in that challenge of working with the blur, working with the motion and not causing people to feel sick to their stomachs. <laughs> and there's, there's a little fine line and it also depends on, on the person. Um, yeah. How do you decide on what size to make the prints? Because I'm kind of struck by that. Like, especially the oceans over there, I could imagine those being arresting it as a really large Prints, but yeah. Um, well, as you can tell, I have tried different sizes and different formats. Um, but they all start life as a uh, thirty-five millimeter. A three by four, yeah. So I'm attracted to this elongation. Um, but how do I decide? Uh, it's mainly by feel. Although I do make reference to the golden section and the Fibonacci uh, sequence, which would be a little hard to explain right now, but um, yeah. That's those canvases, this canvas is 21 by 34 and that's in the Fibonacci sequence which is basically taking golden yeah, the golden ratio, uh, which has, uh, has a universal appeal. It has a sense of balance. Uh, if you want to get the, 
the Fibonacci sequence, you take two numbers, one, one, and add the previous two, you get two, three, five, eight, and so on. Um, so I'm a little wonky that way. Uh, that's part of what informs my, my choice of the, the frames, the dimensions. But it's also by feel. Like how, and and uh, it's constrained by how much money I can put into it at the time, is another piece. Do you, do you always print on the uh, canvas? No, those are canvas. Uh, these are paper that is affixed to a, a wooden, a cradled birch panel. Wow. And those are paper, um, archival quality rag paper in a traditional mat and frame. Yeah, those are, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's, how do you decide that? Well, that's what I started with because oh. it's what I knew how okay. to do. So this is more experimental where mm -hmm. I'm looking, yeah. pop it forward right. and I paint the sides and yeah. had to figure out how to affix it to the surface and everything yeah. else. Without uh, little bubbles and things. Right. Probably. Yeah. Do you know of anyone else who is doing anything similar? Well, you know what, that's part of my uh, thinking about giving this a break. I've been a member of the Pioneer Valley Photographic Artists, and it's a, a group of serious photographers. I've been a part of that group for six, seven years almost. And, no, more than seven, eight years. And, uh, over the years, members of that group have tried it out. They've played around with it and done, it's, it's almost like an homage, and I, I've been happy to see that happen. And then one guy came along who is retired, is an excellent photographer, and saw this method and took it to a place that I thought was sublime. And it did something to me or it's, it changed something in me where I don't want, I don't know, I, I, it's almost as if I think I've been eclipsed as an artist in this particular mode. And I have an interest in finding something new. But I, all I'm, I'm only right now at the place of noticing that I don't know what I will do going forward. I think you should keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll think, eclipse him at some point. I think, yeah, and, and the reason why I said that is not just because I really enjoy these paintings, but I think there's other material that you can go for. Yeah. And like people and different kinds of objects that, for me, the style, um, how can I describe it, it kind of brings out the soul of the subject, mm. and I'd like to see what it would do with people. Well, I have During festivals and fairs where you're capturing all the lights and colors and yeah. all the things happening in one little motion shot. Yeah. That would be pretty cool, I think. I have done carnivals. I've done contra dancers. Uh -huh. I've done a whole series with that. So I'm on the um, I'm the guy on the edge of the dance going. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, for 10 years, this has been alive for me. It's like my, my preferred approach. And I, I've done portraiture, I've done standard representational photographs. And for example, the portraiture, uh, if you've gone to Greenfield's Market and seen the Farmer's Portrait series, that was my work. Um, but yeah, this has some, there's something about the soul, there's something about the encounter with a living object in nature, what I experience is I, I'm moving toward the object and the object moves toward me and there's this like collision and pa, wow. And then there's the frustration of carrying around work that I would rather live in somebody else's home than my own, <laughs> having to price it, having to figure out where the materials are and keep things organized and 
all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not a work. Have you ever considered like mixing mediums? Like, you know, a lot of people say they look like paintings, like painting on one of them or something like that. I yeah. So Philippe, you you call them paintings? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. That too, yeah. And and that happens. Yeah. That that's like the most frequent. Like, uh, it's not even a mix-up. It's like it's kind of a compliment and it's kind of a a strange like visual trick like is it a painting whatever um, well I there are two things I've thought about doing it but I've also thought about saying to a, a painter here's this use it as a starting point and see what happens I, I have a particular <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm not a painter, but I have the urge to try to make a painting that looks like your photograph. <laughs> like, it just feels like it well, must be able to be done. That is a curiosity <laughs> I have. If I went to painting, would I be looking for these effects in the painting? Mm. I don't know. Yeah. All right, thank you. Good to see you both. Yeah. Want some fruit or cookies? No, no, I'll just say. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming tonight and for your attention and questions. Anyone want a last word? Well, you mentioned Camp Kiwani. Yeah. That that's in your neighborhood. Yeah. We must be nearly neighbors. <laughs> okay. I live up on Barton Road. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. So I, I live in the old poorhouse. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Right next door. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, so a couple of the pieces are from that vicinity. Yeah. Have you ever thought of doing a longer series, like you have summer and winter, but of like a place or? Um, I have thought about like getting on the Amtrak and going to a location and doing something right there that's more complete, like Cape Breton in the fall, and it would have trees and ocean and whatever else, people maybe. Um, I, I would also like to move the work. I'm thinking about a pricing structure. There are prices on all of these. And I've thought about having a clearance sale where this is the starting price and next month it's half price and the following month it's a quarter of the price. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am actually I thinking. Well, <laughs> Philippe, I yeah, Philippe has made that request. I think I can make that happen by December. But the price keeps going Yeah. Filing's based on armor. Yeah, basically, that's what that would be. Yeah. You can also do a. My mother is a watercolor artist. Um, I want to say Etsy, but it's it may be another site like that where um, you give this other company. I don't know that you're giving them the rights to do the prints, whatever, but they do all the work for you. All you do is take the picture and send it to them, and they make the prints, and people can order whatever size they want and whatever frame they want, and they do all the printing and the framing and the shipping and all that. Yeah. You just have to. Is that Red Bubble? I don't remember the name yeah. of it. I. It doesn't. I know, I know. But there must, yeah. yeah. I, I have a site at a place called Fine Art America, and they have everything from watercolor, and you know, they could put that on a duvet cover or a coffee cup. Yeah. You know, take your choice. So. And you know, I don't have enough on there, but I get. Oh, weekly I get five, six, seven people look at 
you know, I have like maybe 250 pieces on there. Oh, nice. And I get, you know, half a dozen to so looks, and every couple of months somebody buys something. Cool. So it's a, uh, I wouldn't say I try to eat off of it, <laughs> of it but you know, it, uh, it does provide some cash flow. I've always tried to break even. Uh, um, yeah, so lots to think about. The, uh, th this will be the last thing I'll say. Um, for me, and I told you some of the backstory of where I was personally, um, the, the making of the photograph is uh, a solitary act. I'm out in nature, I see things, I'm interacting with whatever the subject is. And then when I go home and I make my selections and I begin to crop and I'm thinking about presenting this to a viewer, I begin to mentally move toward this conversation. And then when we're standing together and looking at the object, the encounter that I had originally is somehow conveyed to both of us in this present moment. And I find that very exciting, that, that sense that the encounter, whatever it was, can be, because it's now an object in space, can be experienced by new eyes and it be, the object becomes a kind of bridge between me and, and another viewer, which I find pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you. All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions.